Good, good morning and uh, welcome. Um, good morning. So, uh, Ms. McGee, if you could, um, before you introduce your colleagues, um, <clears throat> just in terms of a process wise, you have about 15 minutes for uh, your presentation, uh, followed by. Uh, is that you, Chris? It's good. <laughs> wow. That was a different sound than last time. That was a little weird. 15 minutes. Do you have our attention, Chris? Uh, 15 minutes of presentation uh, followed by uh, Q&A. So uh, just uh, Chris's time, get the timer back there. So just be mindful of uh, your responses, et cetera. So Ms. McGee, would you introduce your colleagues, please? Uh -huh. uh, good morning. Uh, Michael and McGee with the Townsend Group. On my right is Martin Rosenberg. In your materials, he will not be Terry Ahern. He did not dye his hair nor <laughs> lose 20 years. Um, Martin sits on our investment committee. We were originally uh, indicated that was, our meeting would be on the 8th, and uh, Terry had a conflict for today. So I wanted someone from our investment committee to be here to talk to you a little bit about our view of the world and how we implement real estate strategies across all of the towns and clients. So Martin was kind enough to leave Ohio and come to California. Um, on my left is Jennifer Young. Jennifer works with me in the San Francisco office. Uh, she works with, uh, between the two of us, we service 10 different clients out of the office and we provide backup to each other so there's continuity and consistency. You've not yet met Jennifer, but we thought this was a perfect opportunity to bring her in front of the board, have you get to know her a little bit better and give you a little bit of variety in who presents to you on a regular basis. Um, I'm going to start the presentation on page two and I'm going to, I know I always do these wrong. Just start with about a 50,000 uh, foot view of Townsend. Um, I think three of you were here when we were awarded the contract a few years ago. Uh, there's been a lot of changes on the board and a lot of changes within Townsend. Uh, that we, we were founded in 1983 as a real estate specialist. We secured our first client in 1986, which is the, Cal uh, the Ohio Police and Fire. No coincidence that Terry's father was a retired firefighter in Ohio, and they remain a client today. And one of the things we're very proud of is the consistency with which we've worked with their pension fund as well as a number of our clients. We have 72 employees, which is a significant increase from the 50 that were on board when you hired us originally. We manage uh, over $100 billion in assets under advisement and management for our clients, 90 client portfolios doing a variety of different strategies, different risk profiles, different approaches to the industry. Uh, we do have global offices now. We uh, have, since our initial hiring, added a Hong Kong office, which where we acquired uh, a team that Martin will walk you through. Um, and a, uh, an office in, our, in London, um, where we also have a team, team in place. We have specialists, we are specialists in primary funds, meaning just each of the commingled funds that your uh, system invests in. We work with co-investments and we've been tra transacting as well as in, se in secondary units, much like in the private equity market, less common in real estate, but it can be done. Advisory business, which is really what we do for CalSTRS, is the base of everything we've done. It's what we've done since 1983. And as we've developed our business and found solutions for our clients, we've added new areas of business and new focus and, and services that provide what our clients need in order to successfully reach their objectives. 
Martin's going to walk you through the organizational structure and some of, of how our investment committee works, and so I will turn it over to him. Thanks, Michael. And, uh, when I think about what really differentiates the Townsend Group from others in the space, I think it's really primarily the resources that we can bring to bear on behalf of our clients. A and the primary resource that we have is our people. Uh, included in the 72-person team that, that Michael had mentioned is a wide range of people with different backgrounds, and I think very complementary skill sets and experiences. Um, those backgrounds include investment banking and, and law, um, people with very strong quantitative backgrounds. We have a guy who used to form hedge fund indices at MSCI. Uh, we have people who are uh, involved directly in asset management. Um, and we have a lot of people with extensive investment management experience. Michael Lynn was the former head of real estate for Callan. Uh, we have the former uh, chief executive officer and chief investment officer from the ING Select platform uh, in Europe. Um, both of our co-founders are still with the, the firm today, and there are others um, with similar experience and extensive experience uh, in the industry as well. Um, and as Michael ind indicated, uh, we have a global presence. Uh, we have six people in London today and, and three people in Hong Kong. And I think that this diversity of experiences, diversity of views, and diversity of skill sets is really a strength for us and, and for our clients. And the key for us is capturing all of these diverse viewpoints for the benefit of our clients. And the way that we do that is through our investment committee. Our investment committee approves every investment recommendation that goes to our clients and continually reviews and updates our view of the world, which is what guides our investment decisions and recommendations. Um, that document uh, typically contains very specific views. So as opposed to simply favoring a particular country or region, we focus on individual property types, individual markets, submarkets, and strategies within different countries. Um, it's a very labor-intensive process. Uh, the last time we went through Asia, our Asia underwriting team came to investment committee three times, um, and two of those meetings were several hours long. Uh, so it's a very substantial investment of time and senior resources, um, but we think that it's a worthwhile investment because it allows us to, to deliver better advice to our clients. Um, so again, I think that the resources are the, the differentiating or key differentiating factor, um, but I think we're able to deliver those resources to our clients in a way that doesn't <coughs> require them to compromise in any way on client service. As you know, you have a dedicated client service team that tailors the services to meet your specific needs. Um, and I also think that Townsend's a group that, as an institution, really understands the importance of what you do, the importance of what your staff does, um, and our role in that. Um, for example, my, my mom was a public school teacher for 25 years. Um, so this has a, a lot of meaning to me, and I think that's a view that really pervades the organization. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples of how uh, we've, we've brought those resources to, to bear. You, you see on slide four, uh, we've invested nearly $50 billion over the last five years. But what's interesting to me is not so much the amount that we've invested, but the way in which we've done it. Um, taking very focused investment positions and in some cases creating opportunities to allow our clients to invest um, in a strategy that we liked where there wasn't a solution already in place. So for example, a couple of years ago, we concluded that non-performing and sub-performing loans in, in Japan due to some structural shifts in the Japanese uh, financial industry were a very good risk-adjusted return. Uh, we identified a manager that we liked for the strategy, uh, but we didn't like the structure. So we worked with that manager to put in place a US dollar denominated sleeve that was hedged back to US dollars um, and secured fee breaks for our clients. Um, we've created new core funds for in the last several years. We've created new non-core funds to accommodate uh, specific strategies that we've, uh, th that we've advocated. Um, and, and again, uh, the, the services that, that we provide are customized to the needs of, of individual clients. Michael Lynn described uh, the three business lines, um, the traditional advisory, the discretionary, which is fundamentally the same, except that we make the, the decisions for the clients, um, and then a fund of funds business, which is like discretionary, but uh, invest, and it's typically designed for smaller investors where it's not practical for them to engage us on a direct basis. Um, and the discretionary and co-investment clients sometimes also um, use co-investment and secondary services from us. But fundamentally, these three lines of business are really different packaging for the same services. It's just a question of finding the most efficient way to deliver the investment advice to our clients. 
Um, and I know that in the past, some of our competitors try to use the presence of funds of funds as a differentiating factor. Um, the reality is that it's actually pretty common in the industry. I know uh, Cortland has one with uh, Mesero Financial. They're the sub-advisor, uh, Mesero Financial out of Chicago. Um, Kellen has one called Virtus uh, that they're currently sub-advising. Um, we like to be very uh, transparent about it. Uh, we don't think it's a significant issue. Again, it's just a different way of packaging services to make them available to investors that wouldn't otherwise be able to, to access them. So the key for us is generating the best advice and providing it in the most efficient way that we can. Um, and like I said, people, people are the, the foundation of our, our business. But I think they're more effective um, because of some informational advantages that, that we possess. And uh, Jen will talk to you a little bit about that. Thanks, Martin. Um, one of the resources that we bring to bear uh, is our proprietary database of investment level and uh, fund level information, as well as client level information dating back to the 1970s. Um, Townsend utilizes a proprietary database um, and software program to incorporate quantitative and qualitative analysis um, in our dec decision making activities. Uh, we have a dedicated research and analytics team, as well as what we call a development team in-house, um, of which I'm a member. Um, together, we created uh, what we call internally the Townsend <coughs> Investment Performance System, which I will refer to as TIPS for short. Um, TIPS is where we house uh, all of our client level and investment level data and information. Uh, to me, it serves three main purposes. Uh, the, f the first being obviously the collection and the storage of the numerous data points. Um, we collect over 35 years worth of data um, from over 150 managers, and we monitor over 600 active investment positions. That's a lot of information that we're collecting on a quarterly basis. Um, the second main function that it serves for, for me uh, and all of the others within our firm is a tool for analyzing um, client portfolios and due diligence, as well as investment opportunities. So we use all of the performance data we collect to run efficient frontiers, portfolio optimizations, um, provide our clients with some quartile analysis and vintage year analysis to tell them how their selection has impacted their, their plan's performance over the, uh, over the time in history. Um, the third main function that it serves, um, and I think one of the most important functions for us, is really it serves as an internal and external communication system. Uh, with global offices that are operating on different time zones in London, Hong Kong, San Francisco, and Cleveland, it provides us with a centralized place to store all of our information. Um, for example, when there is a new fund offering available, uh, it comes into our system, we collect all the due diligence materials, all meeting notes are logged and stored on the centralized system. So if Cowsters um, or a member of your staff were to um, call Townsend and say, we're looking at an investment opportunity sponsored by Manager X, we could pull up the meeting notes, the due diligence materials, the legal documents, our investment recommendations, and all of the performance and analytics that accompany that investment position. Um, that sounds like a lot of information, and it truly is, because we do monitor over 600 active funds. Um, and this, uh, this resource and information that we've collected over the years has led to um, some strategic relationships that we've formed with industry participants, such as NACREF, um, the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries, and the leading benchmark alternative for public pension plans. Um, we have a nonprofit joint venture with NACREF, whereby they use Townsend yeah. to collect and send them information on a quarterly basis for the publication of their core benchmark, which is the NFI Odyssey benchmark, um, and also the non-core fund benchmarks, which offer our clients an alternative um, and a more apples-to-apples -apples comparison for some of the investments in their portfolio that may have higher levels of risk. Um, and one of our other informational advantages um, is our relationship with other organizations. Not only are we partners with NACREF, um, we also have relationships with INREV, which is the European Association of Investors for Non-Listed Real Estate Vehicles, um, and IPD, which is a global uh, performance measurement benchmark uh, that extends outside of the United States, and the UNPRI, um, which stands for the UN Principles of Responsible Investment. Townsend is a signatory, and it's a sustainability benchmark um, for our clients who are interested in that particular area. I work with um, an associate in our San Francisco office. His name is Nick Rittenhouse. Uh, Nick works directly with your performance, uh, your performance team at Private Edge, and he communicates the, the type of data that Cal Sturz is collecting to me, and I can take that level of information and communicate it to our development team and make sure that all of it's stored in our centralized system. 
Um, so that incorporates all of the, uh, the research and benchmarking areas of our firm. Uh, and the next page really is how we utilize that information to our clients' advantages, uh, page seven. Um, we, we offer different solutions, as Martin touched on, uh, including strategic planning, investment plan planning, monitoring and reporting, and client and advisor interaction. Um, I think one of the most important things that our firm brings to bear is the ability, so every person within our firm is responsible for covering a, a set of active investment positions. With 600 active investment positions and, seven, uh, and uh, over 70 people, that leaves about um, five to 10 active investment positions per person. I don't know how an organization um, with less than 72 people can really accurately report back and uh, communicate to their clients a thorough analysis of all the underlying investments in their, position, in their portfolios without that uh, amount of people. Um, so in the strategic planning and investment planning process, we incorporate all these data points. Um, we also collect information from underlying managers in your portfolio um, to provide capital projections and other data points. Uh, and so I think uh, I referenced that uh, there are over 560 active investment positions available for monitoring today that are open for investment. And so I'll let Martin talk about um, how we manage that information and how we separate our due diligence teams. You're gonna, we're going we're gonna to make Martin skip that part then. <laughs> once, I'm going to point out that once again, we're skipping the view of the world in order to finish in time. Um, so uh, what we do have, you'll see on, the, on uh, the slide, these are our specialists in each of the areas and who covers each of the areas for those funds in those particular specialties. And then this is our current view of the world in summary. And we do have hard copies of this to leave with you if you'd like, but it's part of the information that we always kind of skip around. Um, Jen really touched on a lot of the really important points that we wanted to make today, and that's about the leverage that we provide to CalSTRS. Your staff has had the opportunity to speak to each of our different area experts, talk about the investments that they're thinking about. We've had the opportunity to bring them investment ideas that they were not aware of. Uh, we're, they're right now looking at a fund in the core area for core Asia investing that we've done an initial investment in and full due diligence on. They'll follow the normal process, but the fact is that by having a team in Asia, we were able to complete due diligence on that fund and are the initial investors. Uh, one of our clients chose to be an initial investor into that vehicle, uh, being really the first institutional fund that I'm aware of that's made a core allocation to an open-ended fund outside the US. Uh, and we think that that's something that investors really need to look at since you need core, and there are core assets everywhere. They aren't just here in the US. Um, our due diligence helps your staff. We've had the opportunity to provide them with write-ups that we've completed in, in our due diligence, um, and in fact have made, uh, had the opportunity to bring up issues that your independent fiduciaries had missed um, and, and then end up having an investment not go forward because of that information that they gained from us. A local team, Jen and I are here in San Francisco, but we have a lot of very large clients that we work with across the board, and so we can talk to you about how your brethren, not just across the river, but across the country, operate their programs. Um, our firm focuses on broad knowledge and having depth of knowledge in each area. Uh, we do have a healthy exchange with your staff on and considering investments. Um, Sometimes might, might think it's a little less than healthy, but we, uh, they do listen and they pay attention and we keep in mind what this board has a risk tolerance for and what it does not have a risk tolerance for and as well as your objectives. And our job is to make sure that the program moves forward on that basis. Uh, we have have um, really at this point, we offer no learning curve. Uh, the last five to seven years have been quite an experience. Uh, I think we talked in December that if someone had told me I'd go through the worst market cycle as my first two years of real estate consultant to CalSTRS, I would have said no. Um, but having completed it and looking back on it now, uh, it was a great experience and we've done made a lot of progress with the portfolio and we really hope to have the opportunity to go forward with the portfolio now that it's positioned and your equity markets appear to be giving you some space to make some investments. Um, and move you forward and help you achieve those objectives that you, whatever risk tolerance you establish in your next <laughs> asset allocation study. Um, and with that, we'll just take any questions you have. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll go to questions, the first of which will come from Vice Chair Ms. Hendricks. Great. Um, hi. <laughs> um, we do have a really diverse board. I think you know that um, so several of us are elected teachers. We have ex officio members. We have uh, members that are appointed by the governor. So we all have different backgrounds, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about 
how Tan how Townsend as a consultant deals with that diversity of, of industry expertise from the board's perspective? You know, it's, it's a challenge in the fact that it's about time. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet with a number of trustees outside of the boardroom and talk about questions that they have, bring them up the learning curve. Real estate, like every other asset class, uses its acronyms and its terminology that uh, I, it's, I always say it's like sailing. They can't call it the back of the boat. They have to call it a transom so you feel stupid. And, and so I have a job. This, we use words that you don't really know. Um, it's really about getting to know each of the trustees and getting the time to spend with them talking about what their issues are. Um, you have to kind of go for a common denominator in your presentations um, and make sure that the information that needs to be conveyed is conveyed. And our job is balancing that. And that's it's not an easy job, but we work at it each and every time we make a presentation. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of overseeing and reporting um, on, a real, on real estate investments and the real estate investment program versus other asset classes? What are those challenges? of overseeing reporting? Well, we only report on real estate. I mean, I did spend 10 years at, at a general consultancy. I mean, the private markets just have their private market issues. It's information's not, you, you were going to, you feel free to interrupt no, me. You, were, um, <laughs> you have to, like, as Jen indicated, you have to really focus on it. You've got to be in regular contact with the managers. You've got to know what's going on in the investments because you can't just go to a number that gets recorded onto a tape and sent to your performance measurement people, it's, it's not a simple number. It's, it is about the quality of the assets. The performance of an investment isn't known until it's finished at the end of the day. Um, and so it, 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 there are different challenges. Um, it's what we're structured to do. So we think we do a good job of staying on top of what's going on in each of the investments, taking actions that can be taken, and not wasting time trying to do things that won't be effective in changing the results. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, it's a is your mic on, Mr. Rosen? Is your microphone on? It, it is. Um, you know, it, it's a challenge because of all the issues you have in private markets, appraisal lag and appraisal smoothing, but I think it's also an opportunity. Um, and, and if you really stay on top of the markets enough um, and you can move a little more quickly than, than others, um, I, I think you can add some, some alpha to a program. So, for example, at the beginning of 2010, we saw that the market was turning. We saw on the ground that asset values were starting to move up. We saw that net operating income projections were realistically starting to rise. Um, but the valuations and the open-end core funds hadn't yet moved. And others in the industry hadn't yet realized it. So we put a tremendous amount of capital into those funds in advance of the significant wave of very dramatic appreciation that swept across core real estate in the United States. And now you know, the, the best or the highest demand <laughs> funds have queues of a year or more, um, we were able to get in just before those queues built. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reyes? When you say we, is it we at Calsters or we your group? Uh, we we at, at Townsend across our client base. Okay. And Calsters and, actually did make its commitments before that same appreciation. Uh, uh, going to the slide before that. Slide 11 that you have there. Mm -hmm. Speaking of acronyms, what's the very view. first acronym there? That's the view of the world. Okay. And since we skipped this two slides before, you don't. Yeah. All right. So yeah. it, was, thinking, it was defined. I'm thinking SWOT analysis, strengths, <laughs> weakness, opportunity, threats. It does look like SWOT. I'm thinking value, yeah. opportunity, threats, view weakness, and what would they do it differently? So, yeah. okay, fine. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that we struggle, and I think to follow up with the vice chair's comments, one of the things we struggle with is how to better utilize our consultants. So, you know, what, what is it that you throw it at and say, you know, whoever you pick, this is something you ought to do? Uh, I'm going to go back to our December discussion. It's about time, and it's a challenge. Um, I perceive, in the ideal world, if I could, could have as much time with this board as, as I want on a daily basis, and I have the advantage of having, you know, having worked with you, so I know where things kind of get off track for us. Um, the ability to sit down once a quarter and walk you through our view of the world and where we are and if we've updated it. The ability then on a, rate, on a once a quarter basis to talk about the investments that your staff is making and how they work within that and how, where, where they might differ and the, the bets that are being made. I think those are two elements that, and, and it's not that it can't be done, it's that you have huge agendas and lots of issues to address. And we're 10% of your portfolio, so we try to be realistic. 
Um, some of those things could be done in workshops. I think you know a little bit of creativity, but I, I do think it's it's important to remember that for the last five years, we've really been focused on repositioning this portfolio and making sure that everything that could be done to position you for forward success was being done. That's what your staff was focused on, and that's what Townsend was focused on. You think we've accomplished that? Or we I still do. On it? I do. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? Mr. Lawson? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the investment bank, the investment management field is uh, on the whole notoriously non-diverse in terms of women and minorities. Can, and while at the same time this, this fund, the members of this fund are on the opposite end of that spectrum, extremely diverse. Can you talk to us about your commitment to diversity in terms of your personnel? Um, well, I'm a female and I'm an owner in our firm. Um, we, have, we do have diversity within our firm. I will tell you, it is a challenge in our industry. Um, and it's a challenge in our industry because of the amount of individuals that really are available to us. Consulting is not the highest paying side of the industry. We usually lose the, the diversity to the management side of the industry because they can go there and make a lot more money, quite candidly. Um, finding a person who is uh, who adds diversity to our firm and then also has an interest in being a real estate consultant is kind of narrowing down the field. What we were actually talking about this earlier, we do have um, a diverse, we do have a diverse staff. We're not particularly diverse here, but Mar we have, <laughs> Martin can go through the names because they're all in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Jerome just joined us. We have, uh, who's African American, um, we have Ishika, who's from, from India, um, our niece, who, who's also African American. Yes. We, we try to focus on it. We also try to make sure we have the right resources. But there is diversity within our firm. Uh, and, and obviously, our Asia office is Asian. And, um, it's, I think the most important thing is to understand that it is a commitment. We've worked with Twigo. Um, we've had Twigo alumni in our company as both interns and as employees. Um, and with the one, we had one in our San Francisco office who left to go onto the management side. Um, so we pay attention to it and we try to focus on it, but it, be, it remains a challenge in the industry. Ms. McGee, for, for the sake of the audience and maybe members of the committee, did you work uh, Twigo, Twigo, the Twigo Foundation? Twigo uh, was a gentleman in, in the investment industry who, uh, Robert Twigo, he founded a, an organization that works with minority students, uh, helping them with scholarships and then helping them in uh, through getting their MBAs as well as their undergraduate degrees and then helping them into the investment management industry. And so it's been, uh, matter of fact, we are hiring in San Francisco office this year and I just had a conversation with um, uh, Nancy Sims at Twigo, who had some candidates for us, and so we that we use them whenever we can because they have great access to that pool of candidates. But again, there you know it's a lot of MBA students, and so they, we generally do lose them to the management side. Thank you. Questions? Other questions? Comments? Uh, I think Miss Young uh, addressed it, this issue in her formal comments or her presentation, but. Um, if she did, it wouldn't hurt to reiterate. But, but the uh, role of ESG, uh, env environmental, social, geopolitical governance issues, and the and policies within real estate, and what what is uh, Townsend's view uh, is the relevance of ESG within real estate? Sure, I um, I'm actually the representative and the signatory to the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, which is an up and coming benchmarking. Um, and form of measurement for the sustainability of underlying real estate projects. So um, we became a signatory to the UNPRI in 2009. Um, we were one of the first consulting firms to become a signatory. And our role with the UNPRI is different from what a manager's role would be because we have access to so much information. Um, our role is to encourage the managers to report on environmental, social governance issues at the individual property level through participation in UNPRI or another organization called GRESBY, um, which is a property level benchmark for sustainability and a little bit more advanced than what UNPRI is at the moment. Um, so we are focused on the area. We have clients um, in Europe uh, and here in the US that 
um, require their managers to report on ESG on a quarterly basis or an annual basis. And so we try to house as much information internally as possible to communicate the types of strategi strategies they're utilizing to the broader audiences. For, for us, when we're completing due diligence, um, we're required to ask questions about ESG, and um, there's a section for that on all of our meeting notes, and it's covered in our due diligence questionnaires. Um, we're also um, noticing a trend in the industry, whereas there used to be focused funds in this area, many of the large managers that sponsor open-end fund vehicles or closed-end commingled funds are now focused on ESG as just a general and standard part of their practice. They believe that it adds value and that um, it does make sense from a cost and efficiency standpoint. Thank you. Um, let's see if there are other committee members. Uh, any other committee members that have questions or comments? Can I just ask sure. a follow-up from so we have, your... We've got a few minutes, so... Uh, right, just a follow-up from your answer, Jennifer. Can you talk a little more about... Is it Gresby? Gresby. Can, yeah, can it, you talk a little more about that? What's sure. That it stands for a Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. Um, Gresby collects information from managers, um, and uh, it's the managers report on a non, they don't have to pay a fee to do it. It's free for the managers to be participants in this survey. Um, there are over 360 participants that are completing these surveys, so the information is broadly available if you are a member of Gresby, and, and we are working with Gresby um, and the UNPRI to help them establish best in practice, and l like I said, to get the word out and make sure the management community is aware of these uh, trends and the fact that they're important to our clients investing in real estate. Thank you. Any, anyone else? The only thing I, I was going to add, just because I think it's an interesting, we met with the gentleman from Gresby a, a while ago, and Jen happens to be also on, in our development team internally and, and is working on our manager surveys, and a lot of what we asked and can ask could be incorporated into their benchmark. So we have talked about collecting, similar to what we do for NACREF, collecting that data for them because we have so many managers who really you know, are required to report to us by virtue of our client relationships that we can then, I think we can have a, a bigger impact on that than just asking the question and raising it as an interest and making sure that managers know that we're actively collecting data and that that data gets summarized back up for investors to use. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, seeing no, no other questions, <coughs> thank you for being here, thank you for your presentation yeah. and your response to our questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Hang in there, Dana. Thanks. We're trying. Yeah, I bet. Chris, I see that uh, two members of the committee have stepped away, and uh, yeah, we'll take a um, we'll, re we'll reconvene at uh, noon. Okay, it's about five to twelve. Some of us have to use the restroom. We're back uh, live, and we have our third interview for the uh, real estate consultant for Cal Sturbs. Uh, just in terms of process, we're going to do about uh, provide you about 15 minutes for a presentation, and then we will go to uh, a questions and answers, a uh, question and answer period. So I don't know who, uh, I assume Mr. Callan, you will introduce uh, your colleagues, or is it going to be Ms. Shen? It is. Thank okay. you. Hello, I'm Jamie Shen. I would be your lead consultant, um, and thank you very much for having us here today. I'm joined by Ms. Sally Haskins, who is a senior vice president, and then also by Jim Callahan, who is the head of our fund sponsor consulting. Um, and so I'll let Jim go ahead and, and we are working from a presentation. I think you all have it in front of you. Um, it is a flip presentation. And so we're going to start with Jim's going to give an overview of Callan, then I'm going to talk about our real estate ca capabilities, your portfolio, and then Sally's going to talk about um, some of the other work that we do and we, we would be doing on your behalf. Yeah, so I, my name turned to Jim Callan here. It's Callahan. So Ed, Ed Callan was the founder of our firm. It gets mixed up frequently. So, yeah. I always asked Ed to adopt me, but he never took, never took me up on it. So never did. So. <laughs> 
Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, exactly. uh, thank you very much for having us here. We really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, we're flattered to be considered. Uh, my role here today is really just twofold. I want to impress upon you the importance that the real estate consulting group fits within Callan as an organization, and then to just talk briefly about the organization as a whole and what we think are some of our distinguishing characteristics. So real estate, when I first started at Callan about 20 years ago, we had one person that worked in our real estate group. And really that person was there to support our general consulting assignments that we had as an organization. Under the leadership of Jamie, that has changed dramatically. We've added significant resources to our real estate effort. Um, so where we sit today is not only do Jamie and her group support our general consulting real estate, but also we have direct real estate consulting only clients. So the group has grown significantly and we've spent a lot of time, money and effort to support and grow that group and we'll continue to going forward as an organization. So as an organization, there's, there's three things that I, I think I hope you remember when you, when you think of Callan that are, are distinguishing characteristics. First is that we're an independent organization. We've been independent since our inception 20, 40 years ago and it's our intention to stay independent. And I think that's important for a couple of reasons. One is that we don't have a parent that's telling us what to do and how to manage our business. We manage our business as we see fit, which is for our clients. Our model about how we consult with clients is completely client-driven. Jamie and Sally will get into this more as it, as it pertains to real estate. But we're a client-centric firm, and we want to make sure that when we manage our business, when we think about what type of resources we have, what type of resources do we need, expertise, that we can do that with our clients' interests. When we're growing our firm, we want to make sure we're doing it in a very controlled, measured way. We don't want to have to just grow for the sake of growing or because someone's telling us that they need to add to the bottom line. So that's the first and most important thing. Second is that uh, we have a deep ownership. We have 73 current shareholders of Callan Associates, including the consulting team that's with you here today and others in our real estate consulting group. So that ownership goes deep into the organization. And we've actually gone through ownership changes through our time uh, as an organization. Ed Callan uh, started the firm back in 73, sold his interest to existing shareholders in the late 80s. And since that time, the ownership of Callan has expanded dramatically so that the largest shareholder is, is a, uh, only a 25% shareholder of the organization. So we've gone through the, org the ownership changes that you sometimes see with financial services firms, and we've stayed independent, and we've stayed focused on consulting. It also allows us to attract and retain good people like Jamie and Sally. The second important component about Callan is that we're <laughs> focused in, on making sure that we have deep resources and expertise in all of our areas of consulting. And again, re, uh, real estate is a big part of that. And, and they'll get into that in a little bit. And then just the broader experience of the organization. We've been working as a consultant for 40 years. We've been through different market cycles. We've seen market cycles in the general capital markets. We've seen market cycles in the real estate markets. And that makes us very qualified to understand what's going on out there and help you um, see what's the best for your programs going forward. I'm happy to answer any questions now or at the end if, if it comes up about the organization as a whole. And then on page four, you can see our real estate team. And this is the team we are putting forth that would be working on your behalf. Um, we have a diverse group with diverse backgrounds, but we all share a passion for real estate. Um, as I mentioned, I will be your lead consultant, and if I am not able to attend any of the meetings, then Sally would be here um, in my place. Uh, typically, we will have either Avery being joining us or Lauren as well, but you'll always have either Sally or myself attending the meetings. Um, Sally and I both have over 20 years of real estate experience. As Jim mentioned, I've been with Callan for over 13 of those and always the head of our real estate. I started, as Sally did, and many members of our team with a very on-the-ground real estate experience. I started off in the appraisal business, understanding what drove value in real estate assets. Sally started off in acquisitions, going out and buying properties. Um, Avery was in asset management, and also Jay was in um, acquisitions as an analyst. Sarah and Lauren round out our team. Both of them come to us with a performance measurement background where they started in Callan and then have then grown into those roles in our group. Um, no one our, in our team has less than five years of experience, so we're bringing a very experienced team to your account. 
Additional, one more thing I'd like to say about um, Sally in particular is that in her 23 years of experience, um, it was in acquisitions as well as she spent part of that time living in Australia and running the Asia research platform for Russell Investments. <coughs> On the next page, on page five, you can see some of the people that support our team and our efforts. We have Butch Cliff, who is, runs our operations, and then we have Allie and Paul, who also run our performance measurement groups. And we would be working at, with the data side of your account in the monitoring functions. Additional resources, resources that we would bring to bear include our peer group committees, our client report services groups, um, our capital markets research, which I know you're talking today a lot about risk and return assumptions. They would be helping us if you would look to Callan at all for any of that information. So we, in combination, we would bring another 50 professionals beyond who we've shown here um, that would support our efforts in working on your account. On page six, we talked about some highlights of our real estate consulting practice and our capabilities. What's really important here is just that you know that we are experienced, knowledgeable, and capable of taking on this assignment. We have the capacity to do so, and we currently run with a very low client to consultant ratio of three to one. Um, so we have the database, we have the large public fund experience, we have a broad industry reach, and again, we have the capacity. Our consulting philosophy is to th keep things in a, we don't believe that you have to have a complex um, program in order to meet your objectives. So we want to bring our best thinking in a clear, concise manner, and it's also transparent. And that would be our commitment to you. On the next page, we have our representative client list. And you can see here that we do have large public fund experience. Just to call out a few is the Illinois State teachers, the New York State teachers, and the Ohio State teachers. So we enjoy working with teachers, and we'd like to keep that theme of working with some of the largest teacher funds in the nation. Um, you'll notice on here that we are part of your um, consulting pool. We were added to the pool in 2007, but we did not receive our first assignment from you until 2011. Um, you would think that this is a negative, but I think it's a positive in this regard because we've noticed that you believe that it's a conflict for um, there to be the people who are monitoring your program to have a vested interest in having put a lot of the managers into the program. So in the work that we have done for you, we've only done three independent fiduciary assignments. Um, so we don't have a vested interest in trying to sugarcoat any of the information that we would be giving to you, and we wouldn't come with a bias um, in monitoring your program. We think that's a positive. Um, the other things is to think about our capacity. The two of the clients on here that I personally work with are the Illinois State teachers and the New York State teachers. Other people on our team are the leads for all of the other um, clients here. On page eight, you look at our scope of services and how we run our business and our consulting relationships. We do our full service real estate consulting consultants and um, we always start with the strategic planning and looking at strategic plans, reviewing those, tying the um, objectives together with the policies and then usually we would work on the plan implementation. We know that that's a separate assignment here and so we respect that but we wouldn't just ignore that as well. We would still bring to bear our best ideas of what we're seeing with the other clients that we're doing. For example, fee negotiations. We've currently, we just worked on a project where we did a um, manager search for a transfer of a large separate account. The pricing came in on the management fees much lower and the industry has really changed. So we would want to bring that information to you as well and look at the fees that you're currently paying with your investment managers and we would still feel that that was part of our role and our duty to you to do that. On performance measurement, we have all our own database. It's currently over 600 billion. It's proprietary to us. You're going to hear that a lot today. I think everyone here has their own proprietary database that they run these funds through. We can do the IRR analytics. We have the vintage year peer groups. And we can actually rank them and show them the, your rankings of the managers. We notice right now in your performance measurement, you're not getting that information. We think that that's important, and we would bring that to bear. We also do pacing studies. 
And we can do those to show you how you're going to get there. We can break it out. Are you doing that through direct ownership? Are you doing that through commingled funds? And we can get down to a level of detail that you may not be receiving at this point in time. So education and research, it's a cornerstone of Callan. And Sally's going to talk about that more. But you will have access to our information. And we think that, again, we will try to bring education and research to you in all aspects of the work that we do. We do have some observations on your portfolio. This really ties into, I think, one of the items that was earlier on the um, agenda. And looking at your portfolio and your objectives, and then how then the policies meet those objectives, we notice a slight inconsistency here. Because you're looking for diversification, you do mention enhanced yield, but then right after you have stable cash flows. Um, we believe that with a return target of 9.25%, you are really reaching for yield. Callan's current 10-year projections for real estate is a 6.2%. So there's a 300 basis point, or over 300 basis point delta there. The way you're going to get there is you're going to reach for risk. So you're going to have to take on risk in order to get that. Now, the enhanced yield to your actuarial rate I think you can still get an enhanced yield to that actuarial rate without having to go up to the 9.25%. And so that is something that we would want to have a conversation about if we were hired and discuss what's important, how much risk you want to be taking on, how much leverage. So that gets to, it drives the rest of your portfolio, which we think has a relatively high exposure to non-core. And we think that the core should be greater in your portfolio. We know that you've been working towards that way, but we think that there's a lot more work to be done there. We also notice that you currently have no leverage limitation on your total portfolio and only a leverage limitation on your core and your value added components, but opt 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 opportunistic does not. That is typical, but what you need to have is an overarching limit that would encompass everything in that portfolio as well. So that, again, is to help control risk. It's okay to take risk, but you have to understand what risks you're taking. Um, property level areas of focus. It's just um, that you're underweight to retail and industrial. Really, your exposure is limited to your core portfolio. And in those areas, it's underweight in both of them as well. And then on the manager, on the next page, on page 10, again, we're just trying to show our depth of experience and our breadth of coverage. So we currently monitor or we conducted detailed due diligence on 80% of your portfolio based on the assets under management as of 331. The last quarterly report was available to us. Um, and so we have knowledge of these managers. We could step right up into the relationship. And we could. Um, what we would do is just schedule meetings with all of your managers and understand the businesses or the programs that we don't currently have knowledge of. Um, as well as continue to monitor the other ones. We've been active in international. Activity in international has increased in the last year. Um, we've been doing a number of um, Asia, looking at Asia funds. And Sally has been to Asia twice in the last year. I've been there once. And then we are also looking at European debt as a theme right now. And I will be going to London um, in a couple of weeks, along with another colleague. And we've had other members of our team in Europe as well. So again, this page is just to show that we're knowledgeable, experienced, and fully capable of taking on this assignment. Jamie, you have about a minute now. Great. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Sally. That, that's OK. <laughs> I, um, I sort of expected this. So <laughs> we've worked together you know, long enough to know. And I'm wasting my time here anyway. So on page 11, um, I want to just spend um, a minute and a half, maybe not even that, on talking about our emerging manager and um, minority women and disabled owned effort. And I guess what I would say to you is fostering diversity in the management of investments is very important to us. It's very important to our clients, and it's important to you all. I think the next item on your agenda is to discuss your efforts in that area. I think we would be a strong partner with you as you continue to implement the strategic plan that you've laid out. Um, we have substantial firm-wide efforts that are outlined on this page that have resulted in client investment, and I think that that's important when you're thinking about these programs. It's great to diligence things, but you want to get money out the door at some point, too. Um, highlights on here, we consult to four Illinois plans. I work with two of them. Jamie works with two of them that have legislative requirements. We have testified in front of the Illinois legislature twice now 
on what we're doing on this, in this area. We participate in industry organizations, and we have also have another firm-wide effort called Cal and Connects that augments our activities um, in the area. So we have a big reach-out effort, do a lot of diligence um, on the real assets area, and then generally at, um, at the firm level. On the research and education piece, um, I think we'll overwhelm you with research if we're lucky enough to be hired. We do capital markets, property markets, strategy research, um, and other general research like Jamie said that you would have access to, one of which is something that we just finished was on risk um, and uh, the asset allocation discussion that you had this morning. So you would have access to that as well as the real assets. Um, if you turn to 13, we have something that we call the real estate indicators, and this is an example of our research. It's original research, and we developed this because we wanted to try to be better about anticipating real estate cycles. If you've noticed, we're in an industry that's very cyclical and we haven't done a very good job about predicting things. So this is a set of indicators that looks at spreads <laughs> over time relative uh, and relative to historical spreads. And so the bottom line here is that if you have blue or green, you're probably in an increasing, gonna have an increasing market. If you start to see yellow or um, red spreads, it might signal a transitional or a declining period. This is something we would talk to you about every quarter when we come in to see you and just another tool that we use um, and would be a way to say, you know, maybe we should step on the accelerator or reduce um, the speed and the way that you invest depending on what the environment is. So there's my minute of fame or a minute <laughs> 15 and I'll turn it back to Jamie to wrap up. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think we've uh, exhausted time for the presentation, and we'll, we'll just turn, transition directly to questions, starting with uh, Vice Chair Hendricks. Ms. Hendricks. Great. Uh, welcome. Um, our board is very diverse in terms of our uh, level of technical expertise in the investment world, and so I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you deal with investment boards that have that kind of diversity in terms of experience. Well, we... Most of the boards that we deal with are exactly that same um, composition. And we feel that we're in a partnering relationship. And I've mentioned that education and research is the cornerstone of Callan. And so it's important to us to educate. And it's almost like we are in the teacher role. And we're here to educate, to um, work together, and to have better information flow so that everyone can feel like they're making a more informed and better decision. Thank you. Um, I'll take the next question. Can you talk about the challenges of overseeing and reporting uh, issues related to real estate investments versus uh, other asset classes? What are those challenges um, of overseeing the asset class and the reporting that goes along with reporting from the uh, real estate asset class? Well, it is an. It it is an illiquid asset class. It's one where one of the benefits of it are the inefficiencies in the market and not imperfect information. Mm -hmm. That same benefit of real estate is one of its biggest challenge when it comes to benchmarking. Um, no po two portfolios are ever going to be the same. Um, you're going to have different assets and different portfolios, so you can never have perfect um, portfolio comparisons. So that is a challenge, and the one you don't have in other asset classes. Um, so we have to understand the differences in the benchmarks, and we have to understand the differences in the portfolios, and it causes us to dig deeper into what's driving performance, um, and which is one of the reasons why we have our own database, why we don't rely on other database. Because when a number doesn't make sense, when we look at these vintage year groups and something is off, we have the ability to dig into it, to figure out why it's off, and then to understand if that's something that we should be concerned about or not concerned about. Um, so it is different, and that's it really gets to why we need to control our own information, understand that information, and then be able to articulate the differences. I would say, I mean, there's questions, obviously, about valuation, right? There's valuation, there's timing of the information, there's the fact that we really don't have, I guess, in the REIT world, in the public world, we have investable benchmarks, but the private benchmarks are not investable, right? So, which is part of what you were alluding to. Right. Absolutely. Mr. Reyes? 
Yeah, you spoke about your trip to Asia and your upcoming trip to London, I think. I think the que is a two-part question is what is your uh, international presence and uh, what, what do you see as the challenges in implementing international strategies? Well, we don't have anyone that's located in the markets, to be clear. Everyone in our team is located in the U.S. Um, so I think that's the first answer to your question. Um, the challenges, I think, in implementing an international portfolio um, are, if, and they differ depending on what region that you're in, right? So I would say starting with Asia and then maybe we can go to other geographies. I think part of the issue with implementing in Asia is finding sometimes investment managers that will be around for the long term. There's been a lot of turnover in the manager universe there, and there's a lot of people that are not gaining assets, so you want to kind of pick the winner. Um, to date, there haven't been a lot of sort of core strategies in Asia either. That's been one of the challenges, is that the full palette of investment opportunities isn't necessarily available around the world, so you have to sort of tailor what you want to do to kind of what's there, I guess, which, which makes sense. Um, I think when you move to Europe, um, one of the challenges that we've noticed, and well, and this is true in Asia too, to a certain extent, is that sometimes you have to be careful when you're working with certain investment managers. They don't understand conflicts and the way we think about conflicts and risk sometimes the same way that um, we do. Um, so having that kind of U.S. mindset, um, you know, is important. And then there's all the issues with taxes and currency and what's really your net return and is your capital competitive with the domestic capital in the market, right? Um, so those are some of the things I would highlight. It's just you have to be extra thoughtful and careful about how you implement a program internationally. No question about it. Thank you, Mr. Rex. Anything else? Uh, Ms. Hendricks. So I have a follow-up on my colleague's question and then another question, but do you see that, though, as a weakness for you of not having staff located in, in other areas around the world, or, or how, or we can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, no, no, I appreciate it. Um, we don't feel as it would be a weakness, particularly with the mandate of what we'd be working with you for, which is to set strategic direction and strategic guidance. We believe that if you are there and you are trying to, if you are, have a fund to fund business, which we don't, we are purely non-discretionary consultants. We have no fund to funds. We have no um, discretionary separate accounts. But if you do have that kind of business, and you want to say that you're picking the local operator and um, getting the a China fund that's only doing industrial, then by all means, you need to have somebody on the ground. And we would sit here and say, we are not the right consultant for you because we don't have that, or you need to go through a fund of fund to, in order to get that type of expertise. But to set strategic guidance and to understand what's happening in the overall markets and to set trends and how to approach that, we definitely think we have those capabilities, and we think through the travels that we're doing to the regions, um, we have a good understanding and a good feed of information flow coming from those markets to us and us to those markets. So um, we feel that we can easily, we do not think it's a weakness in this particular situation. And so my other question was about the use of consultants and kind of how you see your role, because I think that's something I've been thinking about as a trustee is how do we use our consultants? How do we use them? How do we get the best bang for our buck? And so how would you, how do you think about if you were hired and you were our real estate consultant, you know, what would the next year look like for you? What kinds of things would you do uh, for us? How do you see your role? Can you give ex some examples of what you would do for, for us as a board? Well, I think in some of it is the observations that we've made on your portfolio already. We'd want to get into your policies more and review those. Um, we would want to help you understand how much leverage do you have in your portfolio? Because I don't, I don't think, I, I don't know if you know that, you might, but in all the information we were gathering and looking up, we don't see that being reported. Um, so we think that that's important to bring transparency to you as to what do you have in your portfolio, what are some different ways to look at it, what are some different ways to look at the risk. Um, we would think about looking at our indicators and saying, okay, well, 
let's walk you through those because we didn't obviously don't have enough time here, but, but let's do a session and walk you through our indicators. What do those mean? What are they trying to predict? What are they saying? And then let's look at that. How, how can you be somewhat tactical in a strategic allocation? And that is just because we do believe in long-term strategic allocations, but there are ways to say, okay, well, if <laughs> we look like we're getting into an overheated real estate market, then maybe either we should be at our target or below in that range, or maybe we should also um, be thinking about changing our substrategy allocation and away from things that are higher risk. Let's not do any development. Let's take things a little bit back. Let's focus on um, not increasing our leverage where we can have more capital loss, um, those types <coughs> of things. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in? Okay. Um, I have a, a question relative to <coughs> excuse me, um, the role that you see ESG policies um, and relevance uh, within uh, the, the, asset, the real estate as asset class. What, what relevance, if any, do, does ESG policies play? Well, we think they're quite relevant. Um, we think that it's important to understand, especially with buildings. I mean, you're in a beautiful building that you've created here, and you obviously care about the environment. And um, we think that it's important because buildings are, and real estate can be, <clears throat> what, excuse me, one of the drivers of, um, you know, carbon and all of the issues that we have. Or um, so. We are working with a group that is looking at creating these benchmarks of kind of awareness. And we're looking at, at incorporating some of the questions about a benchmarking score of managers into our questionnaire so that we can raise awareness. And we've um, committed to doing that with this uh, professor who's leading the charge and um, doing it through like the PRIA is focused on it, which is Pension Real Estate Association. Um, I sit on the board of that, and uh, we're very focused on it, I think, as an industry. But then also, um, Callan is working to make a, a more concerted effort to help raise awareness as well. Thank you. Any any other committee members' questions, comments? OK. Uh, seeing none, we uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your response to our questions. And appreciate you spending some time with us this, this afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, you want to? Yeah, sometimes you've asked staff to summarize our points of view. Sometimes you guys just discuss it. We're prepared to give our view or remain silent. It's your consultant, so if you have any additional <laughs> questions, you could also ask. We, we would uh, welcome some input from, uh, from staff, uh, seeing that they are our consultant, but they work really with staff and work for us. So uh, consultants really spend the majority of their time working with the staff and working for us. So your, your insights and comments would be uh, important. Okay. Um, not surprised that we'll say we can work easily with uh, all three of these firms. As Mike already said, we already do work with these firms. Uh, Callan has also been a general consultant, uh, project consultant to STIRS all the way back in 2003. Um, I've known Cortland since my days of Washington, so a decade and a half ago. Um, the, I think you see the interesting contrast between the firm's personalities come out. Um, Callan, or pardon me, Townsend and, and Cortland are real estate only consultants, specifically that field, where Callan is a uh, multiple asset like PCA. They do a lot of things as well as general consulting, but they have a real estate division. Um, they're the only ones that are in, dedicated here, mostly in California. Um, you also see the strengths and weaknesses of their databases. Um, and I guess I would just, from my perspective, their personalities came out very clearly. 
in terms of, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'm not going to say it because it's online and I probably would be embarrassed because Randy Diamond's in the back from P&I, so I'm not going to say it. But anyway, their personalities came out and I think you got them. Anything you would add? Um, you want to throw yourself under the bus on that? <laughs> no, I, I would say that, uh, you know, this is the, the, the field that is available yeah. in the marketplace today. And um, you probably did hear that there was a crossover. There's a crossover. There, there's a, most of these consulting firms are Cleveland-based. It's that's just by happenstance. It's interesting, but it's by happenstance, that's where the first consulting firms came out of, and, and all of them seem to have a Cleveland office. Born from there. Yeah, born from there. Um, some of the things that the, Townsend is the largest. You know, they're spread out the most. They all have some experience with, with large organizations such as ours. So, but it differs. And, um, you know, Townsend has a California office. Callan has a California office. Uh, Cortland is just opening up a California office to the extent that's important. Some other, um, some other notes that, that are made. Townsend, the, the conflict issue kept coming up, and they, they, they talked about that. And Townsend does run a fund of funds, and they do advise clients and have discretion over, over some of their clients' business. So they make the decisions like a staff does. And I believe Callan said they don't have any discretionary capital, and some people consider that a conflict. That, this is our industry. So to us, to the staff, we don't see that as a conflict. Um, where, where Townsend pointed out, yes, we would bring stuff forward to Calsters to look at. It's just another deal to look at. We have their opinion, but because of the way that we separate what we do, we, they don't make, give an opinion to we get their opinion, but we get an independent fiduciary opinion and our staff opinion for making investments. They, Townsend, has put their other clients, and Callan has other clients, as does Cortland, that go into investments that we've started to joint ventures that we've taken out. Um, Fairfield is an example, and Waterton is an example, some apartment strategies that we've taken out to the marketplace. And they've their clients are in some of our some of our investment vehicles. So um, I would say Chris is correct. It, you can kind of see, I think you should weigh um, how you like presentations done. This is, I think it was a fair representation of how they give presentations. Um, I think uh, Townsend did say, you're going to get, it's how much do you want to get out of the consultant? How much more information do you want from them? And, and how do you like the presentation materials? It's, they all run their own databases. All the databases are flawed, by the way because reporting isn't consistent in the industry. It's not that they're trying to do their best, they're all trying to do their best, but databases are flawed because reporting isn't consistent in the industry. Anything else from staff? Case. Um, no. Okay, Mr. McGuire. Uh, yes, I have a question. Ian, you asked the uh, first firm two questions, but not the uh, two subsequent firms. Would you please comment on that? Chris? <laughs> well, I, I, um, I asked Cortland about um, their emphasis on their being fiduciaries because he kept pressing it. Um, the other two firms really didn't talk about it, so I didn't see any need. I, I really was interested in hearing you know, why he emphasized it. Um, in terms of the relationship between the board and staff, um, you, you know, you, you've worked with Townsend, so you know how that relationship has worked out. And with Callan, I guess I just was lazy. Um, but they, but she did, you know, her, in her presentation, she did address it. And she talked about, you know, her working with teachers in Illinois and um, I, I don't remember where else, New York. So she talked a little bit about it, I guess, whereas, again, um, you know, Cortland didn't really, didn't really address, you know, how they work with staffs and how they work with boards. So that's why I, I you know, didn't ask, you know, all three of them the same questions. Thank you. I, I did want to, I was going to ask Callan about whether they uh, sponsored a fund of funds like Townsend does because of the, you know, potential concerns. Um, but then I looked at their materials and they stated that they do not. So, so I, didn't buy, I didn't ask them that question. Mr. Reyes? 
Chris, is the uh, absence of international <laughs> presence an issue? I mean, that was an issue. Yeah. The other two outfits did talk about their international presence, and they made it a point that, you know, they're in Korea, they're in China, they're in Europe, and this group admitted that they didn't have anybody. But they sort of downplayed it, and sort of you still, you know, clearly they still fund, they still manage funds, or they still deal with international investments. I mean, they have one about 250 million international, and they have other stuff in there. Thoughts on that? Yeah, just real history, real quick. Uh, Corlin had zero. We gave them their international experience because we made them go look at the Deutsche Bank portfolio. So they had to fly with our staff, and they learned it that way. Other comments? Yeah. We I, need it. We do have a, what, about 20% of the portfolio is non-U.S. right now? About 15% we dropped recently because yeah. we had some sales overseas. And so we believe in the long run uh, that, that our portfolio and other pension fund portfolios will be more diversified overseas. Um, Townsend does have offices over there. Like I said, they're the largest. They have the most resources. Uh, I think Jamie made a decent point from a strategy perspective. What, what we really need is the independent fiduciary work the on-the-ground work um, to have offices over there. From a fiduciary perspective in giving the strategy, um, I don't know that it's absolutely necessary, but it is helpful to have to have overseas employees because you get a different feel once you're on the ground. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any, anyone else with a question for staff? Okay. Uh, seeing none... We have uh, a resolution on INV 139. Um, take a look at that and turn it over to Ms. Dillon. Um, I would move uh, that we go with Townsend once again. Okay. Moved by Ms. Dillon to uh, retain uh, Townsend as the real estate consultant. Is there a second? I'll second. It's seconded by Mr. McGuire. I'd like to speak to it. Uh, yeah. Ms. Uh, Dillon, you have, you have the floor. Um, in light of our last couple of comments about the international, I, I felt that was definitely a weakness of Cal, and I think that's a strength of Townsend. Um, but more than that, I think that uh, Townsend's done a yeoman's job of taking our portfolio at the time that it was coming on board as our consultant. Um, at the time that we were having a lot of difficulty with the real estate portfolio and working with staff and turning that around and helping us go through that process also. Um, I'd like to see them have the opportunity to then do what um, they can to help enhance that portfolio with us now that we're kind of getting that base down. Um, I think Michael and has um, taken our criticism uh, that we've had in the past to heart, and she has reached out to us. Um, I very much admire that in her. Um, so I, I would like to see that contract continue. Okay. 